Ladies and gentlemen, namaste and welcome to all the distinguished guests at the Institute, both those here in our beautiful headquarters at 31 Bly Street and those joining us online for this special event and address and a conversation with India's Minister of External Affairs, Dr. Subramanyam Jai Shankar. I'm Michael Fullilove, the Executive Director of the Lowy Institute. Let me begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land on which we are gathered, the Gadigal of the Eora Nation, and pay my respects to their elders past and present. Ladies and gentlemen, it gives me great personal pleasure to host my friend Dr. Jai Shankar at the Institute this evening. He and I were introduced more than a decade ago by his son Druva, who was a colleague of mine at the Bookings Institution in Washington, D.C. in the late noughties. And Druva has been a non-resident fellow here at the Institute for some years. He's doing a fabulous job in Washington, of course, running ORF America. This year, Jai, I couldn't be at the Rizina Dialogue, but um, Samir Saran and Druva were kind enough to invite me to participate in Rizina DC at a panel with Michelle Flournoy and Senator Bill Haggerty and Mira Rap Hooper from the National Security Council that was beamed into Rizina, and I was grateful for that courtesy. Ladies and gentlemen, I've known and admired Jai for more than a decade, and in that period I've called on him in Beijing and Washington, where he was representing the Republic of India. Uh, I've called on him in Delhi when he was heading up India's uh, Foreign Service as Foreign Secretary, and now, of course, we're delighted to host him as the Minister. He spoke actually virtually at the Institute in 2020 um, during the pandemic, uh, and last year, he was kind enough to invite me to give the Atal Bihari Vajpayee Lecture, which was a great honour. Dr. Jai Shankar and I are both great cricket fans, and today he's had a big day. He went up in a chopper, um, he inspected a lot of ADF assets, and he was at the SCG, where he was personally escorted by Steve Waugh. So let me say, Jai, I am fully aware that I'm playing second fiddle um, today. Uh, but I have always thought that the game of cricket is a lot like the great game of foreign affairs. Things are opaque in cricket as in diplomacy. Sometimes a draw is actually a win. The weather conditions and the state of the pitch are critical. The ball swings in the air and it, it jumps off the pitch. Sometimes it flies at your head. And in foreign policy too, the decision-making environment is fast and fluid. And that's certainly the case today. It seems to me the relationship between New Delhi and Canberra in a way has the character of a long Steve War innings, if you'll allow me, Minister. We started off slowly, we dug in, we got, it, we got our eye in, but now that we've settled in, we're taking our shots and the runs are flowing. I might say I wish they had been flowing a little more in Australia's direction during the recent T20 series. Um, Australia has many things that bind us together. We have deep historical and personal connections. There is a brilliant and talented Indian diaspora in this country. But increasingly, we also have a shared view of the world. Through organisations such as the Quad, Australia and India are demonstrating the shared conviction that all countries should have the right to make their own way in the world free of coercion. No country should be forced to live in another's shadow. So our worldviews are coming closer. Our bilateral cooperation is also growing. In 2020, we set up the Comprehensive Strategic Partnership. In April this year, we signed the India-Australia Economic Cooperation and Trade Agreement. We've increased the pace of military exercises. There are also some welcome positive signs on the economic front with an uptick in two-way trade last year. Many of us still feel that the private sector has been a bit slow to catch up with these developments, but I'm sure that with visits like this by the Minister and the work of people such as Ashok Jacob, those things will also speed up. Working together, I really believe that countries such as Australia and India have the wherewithal to help shape Asia's future. But first, we need to believe in ourselves and in each other. Ladies and gentlemen, the former US ambassador to India, Richard Verma, described Dr. Jaishankar as one of the world's best diplomats, and I agree. 
Dr. Jaishankar was born into a distinguished family of high achievers. He is a graduate of St. Stephen's College at the University of Delhi, and he earned his doctorate from Jawaharlal Nehru University, specializing in nuclear diplomacy, which is probably useful at the moment. He joined the Foreign Service in 1977. He served in capitals such as Moscow and Tokyo. He was ambassador or high commissioner in Prague, Singapore, Beijing, and Washington. He also held a number of important posts in India, culminating in his appointment as Foreign Secretary. After retiring from the, the Foreign Service in 2018, Dr. Jaishankar joined Tata Sons, but following the 2019 election, Prime Minister Modi appointed him Minister of External Affairs, the first Foreign Secretary, I think, to occupy Room 172 in South Block. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming India's Minister for External Affairs, His Excellency, Dr. Subramanyam Jai Shankar. Jai. Good evening. Uh, Dr. Michael Fulila, uh, High Commissioner, dear friends. Let me begin by uh, emphasizing what a great pleasure it is to be back here. Uh, back, I've been here physically once before and virtually a few times. And I'm here really at the tail end of her visit to Australia, uh, my second as a foreign minister this year, uh, which I think in itself is a bit of a statement about the relationship. Uh, I also come here after not just a good day, great day at the SCG, but after a, also a splendid day in Canberra. Uh, I had uh, very good conversations with Foreign Minister Penny Wong, with uh, DPM and Defence Minister Richard Marles, with the Education Minister Justin Clare, uh, spent some time with the Australian Defence Forces. Uh, but of course, nothing tops the war. Uh, now, uh, I think perhaps, Michael, we've once discussed the idea of writing a serious book on diplomacy, which is disguised as a serious book on cricket. Uh, because there are actually, you know, they're, they're both very competitive uh, occupations. Uh, and there's a lot really that one can learn uh, from uh, any kind of competition if you were to transpose its lessons uh, to uh, a different uh, domain. And in fact, when I was uh, walking around with Steve Waugh and, you know, a lot of his conversations were about him and Sachin Tendulkar, uh, it did strike me that, you know, he'd be, he'd be kind of a useful guy to have around with you when you are strategizing, when you're looking at a difficult world, uh, at trying to, you know, read bowlers and pitches and, uh, and uh, as he, he, he was actually telling me what a difference having support from the crowd uh, does. So, so uh, you know, there were some interesting and instructive observations there. But uh, let me uh, come back to, to really the, uh, the serious business, the uh, India-Australia relationship, which has been the focus of my visit. Uh, I am the sixth minister of the Modi government to visit Australia this year after the Labour government has come into power. And that in itself should tell you something about the seriousness with which we approach this relationship. Uh, during this period, of course, we've had uh, uh, the Deputy Prime Minister and Defence Minister visit India, uh, two uh, pre a Premier and a Deputy Premier from Australia as well. Uh, we've had a Chief of Naval Staff from India. Uh, we've had two uh, significant military exercises in which India has participated. And I cite all those examples to you uh, as a sign of this changing relationship that we speak about. Now, uh, what has led us to discover or rediscover uh, each other uh, more profoundly than before? Uh, I think it's a combination of factors. Uh, some of it uh, are the changes in our own societies. Uh, some of it are broadening interests as uh, 
we have both become more globalized. Uh, and in India's case, uh, as we have started to look and act eastwards uh, in the last quarter century. Uh, and some part of it, uh, I think, is also uh, an outcome of the larger geopolitical changes in the world. Uh, changes which directly impact the region uh, of which India is on one side and Australia at the uh, the, uh, the other uh, end of the periphery. Now, uh, my sense today is uh, given the the interest we have, given the uh, the the relevance that we have for each other's. Uh, uh, strategy and uh, calculations. Uh, I, I clearly uh, have the confidence that this relationship is going to pick up steam very, very rapidly. Uh, we passed you know, one milestone uh, with the uh, conclusion earlier this year uh, of, a, uh, of a free trade agreement, uh, which is currently uh, under the process of ratification. Uh, it also included uh, some changes uh, in business practices, which would make it much easier for, for our companies to, uh, to work with each other. Uh, this is in the domain of tax. Uh, I have seen uh, a great deal of uh, interest in Australia uh, about uh, uh, enhancing the, uh, the quality and the a scale of the education interface between us. Uh, and uh, when I look at uh, other businesses which would be natural to Australia, uh, minerals, energy, uh, uh, I, I, agriculture, I, I think uh, there are possibilities here. And uh, the six ministers who came, the five apart from me, a lot of their attention were actually devoted to exploring these opportunities uh, in the relationship. Having said that, uh, I would uh, like to place this relationship in the, in the larger uh, context of global politics. Uh, I think in an immediate sense, we are grappling with what I would call a 3C challenge, which is COVID, conflict and climate change. I think these are the three big issues which have disrupted uh, world politics, disrupted the world economy. And uh, in many ways, I think they frame uh, the, the larger context in which uh, India and Australia uh, discuss uh, world politics. Uh, but preceding those, uh, or certainly preceding the Ukraine conflict and the COVID, uh, are the longer term changes which have been unfolding uh, really over multiple decades. Changes which perhaps had one big inflection point in the global financial crisis of 2008. Uh, the fact that uh, uh, we are looking at a much broader distribution of power and influence uh, in the world. Uh, that uh, that conversations and decisions uh, are no longer as narrow uh, as they used to be. Uh, I I would say the global rebalancing in many ways uh, is is a is a even bigger picture in which uh, we need to uh, look at the relationship. So uh, for me, uh, whether it's the the uh, accumulated bilateral relationship or the geopolitical changes uh, or uh, you know the the big global issues of the day i think all of this in a way has been distilled into the uh, emergence or the reemergence of the quad uh, i would uh, argue that one of the reasons why the quad worked uh, in 2017 and subsequently, as opposed to the first uh, attempt uh, at it in 2007, a decade earlier, uh, was the fact that India's relationship, bilateral relationships with the other three quad partners 
had developed sufficiently by 2017 for us to actually take this initiative forward in a manner in which perhaps we couldn't do a decade uh, earlier. And in that, uh, if, you, if you look at it chronologically, and I've had the privilege of being associated with all these relationships, uh, I would say the India-US had changed uh, in the most dramatic and perhaps in the most profound manner. India-Japan evolved uh, much more steadily, but the relationship which really had to play catch up was the one between India and Australia. And I think today that catch up is, is happening. So it's a bit like falling behind in the first innings and you know trying to make up in the second. Uh, but uh, certainly today for me, the, the progress of the bilateral relationship, the ability to work together uh, at a regional and global level, uh, and uh, uh, the, the interest in shaping uh, really the evolution uh, of the uh, of the world order, uh, I think these are different facets of the uh, of the relationship that we're talking about today. Uh, so it is for me very much a priority, which is why I'm here a second time. So once again, really thank you, Michael, for putting this together, uh, and uh, I look forward to the conversation. Wonderful. Thank you, Jai, for those opening remarks. Thank you for having a conversation with me now and taking some questions from the audience in the room. I want to start at the global level, mm -hmm. and then I want to come back to the bilateral relationship that, that you spoke about. Um, you mentioned the three Cs, COVID, conflict and climate change. Let me ask you about the second C, the conflict in Ukraine. A few days ago, President Vladimir Zelensky was on this very stage, albeit by video link. Let me begin by asking, what have you made as an observer of individuals and politics and diplomats and leaders, what have you made of his wartime leadership over the past eight months, I guess starting with that critical first weekend after the invasion when he knocked back an offer of safe passage out of Ukraine with that memorable phrase, I don't need a ride, I need ammunition. What have you made of Zelensky as a president? You know, uh, in uh, any situation, uh, uh, you're partly shaped by your impressions which, which are inherited or which, which pre-exist. Uh, and uh, uh, the only time I've seen him up close uh, was actually at Glasgow uh, on the sidelines of the COP26 uh, when he and Prime Minister Modi had a, uh, had a very interesting discussion uh, about, about a range of issues, including, uh, you know, uh, business cooperation, uh, investments, trade, you know, what, what could Ukraine do to build up its relationship with India because... Uh, uh, it wasn't really as substantive as it could be. Uh, that was my first impression. Uh, I must also confess, I've really not uh, focused that much on the uh, on the leader, you know, individual leaderships of uh, uh, different countries in that part of the world. Even though I'm very familiar with uh, that part of the world, largely because. We've never had a crisis or we've never had the stakes out there to, to, uh, to be that intensively uh, engaged. Uh, having said that, I, I think, uh, uh, you know, a lot of what uh, uh, are, the, uh, are the perceptions of the world have been shaped by obviously the events which have happened. Uh, for us, from an Indian perspective, our particular challenge uh, was that we had 20,000 students uh, in Ukraine. Uh, they were caught in the middle of the conflict. Most of them studied in eastern Ukraine. Uh, and uh, extricating them required uh, required uh, uh, not just uh, diplomacy in the normal sense, but actually uh, having, uh, you know, Prime Minister Modi call up Zelensky, call up Putin, uh, engage me talking to Kuleba and to uh, Lavrov and at various other levels. Uh, so I, I think there's a kind of a cumulative uh, picture out here. Uh, 
and uh, 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 so certainly our expectation uh, would be that uh, you know he is somebody uh, we we will continue to be engaged with. In fact, Prime Minister Modi spoke to him last week. Mm-hmm. Uh, in uh, uh, in what we believe uh, is the need to uh, to uh, you know return to the path of diplomacy and dialogue because. Uh, we honestly don't think this conflict is is helping anybody at all. As an analyst, um, how do you think the war in Ukraine is altering the balance of power in the world? A lot of people say that it is exposing authoritarian states as brittle and weaker than we thought they were previously. What would you say? You know, it's it's a bit like that French Revolution question, which was asked of Chuan Lai. I really, honestly, think it's a bit early in the in the day to reach. Uh, very strong uh, conclusions. I mean, uh, this is a conflict which has gone in many ways uh, in unanticipated directions. So if your first six months were not exactly predictable, I'm not sure i have been in a hurry to reach a conclusion mm. uh, right now. And that's not a dodge. It's a, it's a genuine, uh, I, I would say, uh, withholding of judgment because... Uh, I, I don't think anybody serious right now can quite predict uh, where this conflict is going. We've seen dreadful images out of Ukraine over the last 24 hours. Can I invite you to comment on on those missile strikes? Look, uh, you know, we, we actually, uh, like many other countries, uh, we issued a statement uh, yesterday uh, on that. And uh, uh, we really think that... Uh, uh, you know, uh, targeting infrastructure and uh, uh, causing civilian deaths in in you know is 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 in in any in any part of the world anywhere. Uh, and uh, I mean, obviously here we are you are talking specifically about Ukraine. I mean, uh, this is this is not something that is uh, uh, that is uh, acceptable. And we uh, again, I I. I think uh, our effort has been to keep pressing for for a return to diplomacy and dialogue. Speaking of diplomacy, in President Zelensky's remarks to the Institute, uh, I asked him, what, do you, what would you like Australia to do mm-hmm. for Ukraine? And he asked that Australia use its influence at the United Nations to convince as many countries as possible to vote later this week for a resolution in the General Assembly condemning Russia's annexation. Uh, alleged annexation of four Ukrainian um, territories. Can you can you tell us how India will vote in that vote in that uh, vote? You know, Mr. I was asked this question yesterday at a press conference, so I have to give you the same reply. You can give us a different one if you want to reveal more information. Uh, well, I could give you this a different one with the same message, which is <laughs> normally you look nobody nobody puts their vote out. You know, the decision to vote. Uh, out in front. I mean, you you take the call when you have to. Uh, And uh, um, we continue to be guided by uh, the the need uh, uh, because, look, you have to understand something. A large part of the world today is hurting because of this conflict. Uh, It's hurting because uh, their daily lives are impacted in a in a in a very very damaging manner, and these countries uh, with whom we identify ourselves, most of these are countries of the global mm-hmm. south. They are they are actually uh, uh, feeling frustrated because they feel that their problems are being uh, neglected. Uh, they're not being recognized by the global debates, uh, and uh, that uh, uh, for them, uh, you know. Uh, uh, some kind of uh, a speedy remedy uh, to the challenges that they few face in uh, terms of energy security, food security. Uh, those are really uh, very, very uh, pressing challenges. Uh, if you, you know, as, as someone who, who talks to a lot of my peers and uh, uh, engages uh, uh, many of them uh, personally, and I've just come out of the UN, a general Assembly where I've met close to about 100 foreign ministers. Uh, 
Uh, I can tell you the large body of opinion out there is to try to find a way of bringing this conflict uh, to uh, a speedy end and getting back to the negotiating table. And I think it's important that that sentiment uh, should be factored in. Uh, and that uh, uh, in the, you know, uh, it's, it's uh, understandable or perhaps uh, to be expected uh, that, you know, uh, different countries in different regions would pursue uh, their priorities and their approaches mm. uh, to this conflict. Uh, but uh, uh, if, they, if it is pursued in a manner in which a big part of the world, uh, I would, if I can use a metaphor, in a way you can look at it as an east-west conflict, but it has a north-south dimension to it. Uh, and I, I think if the south feels increasingly that the north is tone deaf, that you know uh, that their suffering, their uh, uh, their anxieties are not being addressed. Uh, I think uh, that's something which will create a new set of problems, and we we can sense that very strongly. Let me change tack and ask you about China, mm -hmm. um, if I may. As you know well, for two years Beijing had Canberra in the diplomatic deep freeze. And since the new Australian government took office in May, lines of communication have been reopening in different ways. Um, it did seem to me that communications were never interrupted to, to quite the same degree between um, Beijing and Delhi, even in your most difficult periods when there were bloody clashes between your two militaries. Can you give us, I know you're very diplomatic, but can you, given that Australia is going through a transition period in our relationship with China, what would be your advice to Australia about how you um, establish, re-establish a stable, productive relationship with a country that is so different from our own? You know, uh, I am, uh, especially after I became foreign minister, I'm very careful about giving advice. <laughs> I'm even more careful about giving advice publicly. Uh, what I can uh, share with you uh, is that uh, we've had a two and a half very difficult years in our relationship with China, uh, which has included uh, the first bloodshed we've had on the border uh, after 40 years. Uh, and uh, where we, we actually lost uh, 20 soldiers. Uh, but our endeavor, my endeavor, has been uh, to keep uh, the communication lines going. In fact, the morning after that, uh, I called up my counterpart, Wangi, uh, and uh, urged him to, uh, to uh, you know, ensure that, uh, you know, there are no... Uh, escalatory moves or uh, complicating moves on, on the Chinese side. Uh, so uh, for me, diplomacy is about communication. You know, it's not uh, just in relationship to China, even in relationship to your earlier set of comments about Ukraine. You know, if diplomats do not communicate uh, with each other, then what kind of diplomacy do they do? So. Um, I, I really feel, you know, uh, shutting down, um, talking, burning bridges. And I say this as a general principle. I would, I would not, uh, uh, you know, uh, recommend it to anybody. There can be very testing times. I mean, we have uh, another neighbor with whom we have a very difficult uh, relationship. But, you know, at the end of the day, you know, countries have to deal with each other. And you have to find some way. Uh, of of uh, keeping keeping that going. Let me ask you about India's relationship with the United States. Mm -hmm. um, in the past few years, it, the US has overtaken China, I think, as India's biggest trading partner. There have been a number of steps that have been taken, in, even in um, recent years, with intelligence sharing and 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 so on. What sort of changes have you noticed in the relationship since President Biden was elected? How is it? How is it? How has it changed in different ways as 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 Biden came in? Well, uh, you know, uh, India, the India-U.S. relationship started changing. I would say from Clinton's second term. Mm -hmm. uh, Clinton came to India in two thousand. Uh, 
literally the last year of his presidency, he he sort of started something moving. Uh, then really George W. Bush, uh, I think, did the big moves thereafter. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it's interesting, you had five American presidents, Clinton, Bush, uh, Obama, Trump, Biden. Uh, can't think of five people more different from each other. Mm-hmm. Uh, who have disagreed uh, amongst themselves on a whole lot of issues at home and abroad, but who've actually been singularly consistent uh, in the manner in which uh, they have sought to engage India and to enhance our relationship. So, you know, when you are faced with, when you look at that kind of consistency, you realize that in many ways, uh, this is this is deeper than the politics of the day. Mm-hmm. Uh, that this is uh, something which is structural, where there is actually a kind of an establishment consensus, if you would, because remember, they've alternated Mm -hmm. uh, politically as well. Uh, So now in the case of uh, President Biden, uh, because he's been around uh, for a long time, you know, I mean, I've been around a long time and I can say here's someone who's been around very much longer. uh, he's he's actually been involved in the growth of the relationship at different points of time. Mm-hmm. I remember seeing him, going to see him uh, along with my boss in 2005. Uh, to uh, at that time, uh, I think if I remember right, he was the ranking minority member of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. Dick Lugar was the chairman, uh, and you know seeking his support for the nuclear deal. So he's he's known this relationship or he's seen, he's seen the evolution of this relationship. Uh, and uh, uh, as vice president, you know, when, when uh, Prime Minister Modi came to uh, the US in 2014, I was the ambassador then, uh, he was one, of, he was vice president and he was strongly supportive of what we were trying to do. But there's a larger point, I think, about uh, the Biden administration. Uh, in one way, it's an extraordinarily experienced administration. Uh, if you look at the, you know, Secretary of State, the uh, the NSA, the the Director CIA, the DNI, uh, even uh, the Secretary of Defense. I mean, these are people who work multiple administrations, know the world. You know, they're not new on the job. I mean, they they really put it together. You're really looking at, you know, hundred plus years of experience out there. Uh, Secondly, uh, you know, collectively, I think this is an administration which is uh, very, uh, uh, very determined to get along with the world, uh, which is willing to make the adjustments uh, in many ways to 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 find, maintain, and develop partners. Uh, so I and and you know I I do not mean it in any way as disrespect. It's not easy if you're the most powerful country in the world to be necessarily sensitive and necessarily adjusting. Uh, to me, the big change and one of the reasons, I mean, one of the reasons in my opening remark, I said that, you know, the Quad has is working well because mm. the bilateral, the pillars of the Quad are all well developed and are working well. But I think one other reason the Quad is working well is actually the United States is showing the flexibility and the understanding mm. uh, to make the quad work well. And this is a big evolution, uh, to my mind, really, in America's approach to world politics. Mm. How can we make the quad work better? What else would you like to see the quad do? Uh, right now, I, I don't see any big uh, obstacles. Uh, but uh, to my mind, uh, for, you know, in a, in a way, the quads. Uh, quotes novel. I mean, it's novel in the sense that typically, uh, you know, the post-45 world has, uh, the post-45 world, which you know better, which we have less experience of. Uh, it's a world of, uh, you know, treaties and uh, alliances and uh, uh, and uh, sort of legalistically underpinned mm. uh, commitments. Uh, you actually have a grouping very easy uh, you know, there's, there's no, there's no agreement. There's no secretariat. Uh, these are practices. We make it up as we go along. Uh, so 
it's uh, it's uh, just a, a much more loose limbed way of uh, an open minded way of actually uh, working together which by the way suits us when i think today suits uh, the other three countries as well uh, so for me it's not like we have a a barrier and impediment what we probably would need to do is to keep uh, you know a bit like your phone need to keep pressing the refresh button mm-hmm. uh, and getting new ideas and uh, you know how do you keep growing the agenda mm. uh, i my sense is uh, i've i've uh, dealt with quad uh, this time around as both as foreign secretary as the permanent secretary before now as the minister uh, i've seen it now grow to the summit level uh, but uh, we the more we work together the more we will find uh, areas for for cooperation this this is actually a kind of a exploring and doing uh, at the same time mm. all right let me come to the bilateral relationship when i interviewed you 2 years ago you said to me that if there is one relationship i take great satisfaction in it's the india australia relationship um as you mentioned uh since the change of government there've been a whole string of um indian ministers uh visit australia um what you you were making interesting comments earlier about how the us india relationship is changing for structural reasons as much as personal reasons you talked about an establishment consensus is that how you'd characterize the changes in the india australia relationship too or to ask the question a different way has it changed since the change of government change of prime minister change of foreign minister um how how much of this is personal and how much is structural uh i am increasingly getting the impression that it's structural here too uh because uh, quite honestly uh you know we are just as comfortable with this government as we were with the previous one uh, and a bit in mind uh, because uh, again if i were to pick an inflection point uh, in the case of the us i took clinton and then bush as the two inflection points i think here it was really the it was that tony abbott modi exchange of visits in 2014 which really set the ball rolling mm. uh, and uh, uh, since then uh, we've had multiple uh, prime ministers in australia uh, but uh, uh, i think uh, all of them showed uh, a commendable level of interest in in growing the relationship uh, and uh, uh, my own uh, involvement at a political level is you know pre your election and post your election and i i would say and and actually it so happened that uh, for for your current government the first day on the job was to spend time with us in tokyo mm-hmm. because we had a quad summit mm-hmm. uh, so i frankly think it's been a very very smooth transition uh, i see just as much uh, interest mm. uh, same enthusiasm uh, uh, whatever was uh, worked out in the last days of the previous government the trade stuff the mm. financial stuff is moving along mm. uh, i think there are a lot of new ideas on the table which uh, will get picked up i uh, again you know i i think particularly education uh, offers a lot of possibilities possibilities not just at this end actually to to internationalize and uh, uh, modernize uh, the indian uh, education system as well through greater global exposure uh, so so i i think i'd be I'd be fairly confident saying that this has now become structural here. What about the relationship between the leaders, Mr. Modi and Mr. Morrison? Famously, had a good relationship. I don't know whether Albo's such a deft hand with the curry or not, but but what have you noticed in that, especially in that first quad meeting between Mr. Albanese and Mr. Modi? No, well, you know, I I th- I thought that they got along, uh, uh, but uh, visibly well. uh and i think uh, some of that uh, uh my my recollection of that uh, meeting was uh, i think the prime minister your prime minister spoke about his uh, visits uh, personal visits to india uh, and mm-hmm. i think uh, there was there was some interesting stuff he said there which caught you know our attention in a good way mm-hmm. uh, so uh, i'm pretty confident that uh, you know uh, this relationship is going to go well uh, they've they've done a, a virtual 
uh, virtual meeting as well after that. Mm. Uh, so, so I'm, I'm, I, I think the chemistry will be good. Let me ask you about AUKUS, which is a speaking of innovations, is a huge innovation mm-hmm. in Australian foreign policy, especially the commitment to acquire a fleet of nuclear propelled submarines. Um, I understand from the interviews you gave yesterday that India supported the recent IAEA assessment that the plan doesn't represent a proliferation risk. Can I ask you, um, is that the case? Are you comfortable with it from that point of view? But also, um, what do you make of AUKUS as a, as a, as a nuclear power yourself? Um, what do you, how would, would the acquisition of this kind of capability change India's perception of Australia as a strategic actor, as a, as a strategically capable actor? Look, uh, Nash, these are capability decisions and, in a sense, uh, strategic calls are for the country's concern to make. You know, uh, it's not uh, reasonable, and frankly, uh, it's not sometimes even fair for another country, uh, you know, to to pass uh, judgments on it when you don't have a full necessarily a full and informed uh, picture of uh, of the whole issue. So uh, we, we have been quite uh, prudent about uh, about uh, voicing uh, mm-hmm. uh, our view uh, on, on the decisions which you took and that's understandable. Uh, my point which I made yesterday uh, to your press was that uh, the you know, the matter did come up. I think there was some press, prior press, press speculation on this matter. The matter did come up at the IEA general conference. Uh, we took the position, you know, because I can speak for myself here. We took the position that uh, we would uh, respect the judgment of the uh, IEA director general, Rafael Grossi, which you know, many of us know him. I know him personally. Uh, we have a great deal of regard for his objectivity and his uh, professionalism uh, and uh, therefore uh, you know that's it now uh, it would appear that you know this sense was shared by a number of other countries and that's really what happened uh, out there all right very dealt with that one very deftly i thought um Ladies and gentlemen, we have a few minutes for questions from the audience, and then I might come back with one more perhaps for the minister. But let me let me go to the audience now and see. I see Penny Wensley, who is a Lowy Institute board member, but also a former Australian High Commissioner to India. I'll just, yeah, I'll ask the questioners to wait for the microphone and then put their question to the minister. Thank you. Thank you very much, Michael. And minister, thank you. Uh, I was very interested to watch your address to the UN General Assembly Mm -hmm. just a couple of weeks ago, and you referred to reformed multilateralism, and you acknowledged that reform of the Security Council was at the core of that, but that's a really hard nut to crack. Uh, How, in fact, do you think India can advance its purposeful agenda for reformed multilateralism. And I ask you this against the background of your strong commitment to diplomacy and paying more attention to diplomacy, but also as a former ambassador to the UN and committed multilateralist. I think if India can help to lead the way on this, then it would be a very good thing in the current circumstances globally. Mm Well, uh, I agree with you that it's a hard nut, but hard nuts can be cracked. Uh, And, uh, you know, if I look back and say, well, uh, this one is too difficult, I wouldn't be doing too much uh, in my life. I mean, life has been a set of challenges, particularly for a country like India. Uh, So so I, I would not let the, the difficulties of that uh, challenge deter me or discourage me. Uh, in fact, I'd put it the other way around. Ask yourself, uh, I mean, put India aside for a moment. Uh, look, there are whole continents today which actually feel that the Security Council 
processes do not uh, take into their uh, take into account their interests. I mean, I spoke earlier about Ukraine and a sense in the global south that their problems of food and fuel and fertilizer are being just uh, brushed aside. Uh, and frankly, at the U, if you if you go to a UN General Assembly uh, uh, and talk to countries, you know there are countries in Africa and Latin America and the small island states, uh, quite apart from Asia and India, who feel very very strongly that this is not their UN uh, in a way, and I think that's hugely damaging uh, to the UN. So one of the developments this time, in fact, has been a, a very uh, explicit recognition by uh, President Biden uh, of the need to actually reform the UN, which is not a small uh, development. But we need to get, because uh, we all know why reform has been blocked uh, for so many years. So I think it's important to keep up the pressure. It's, uh, there is global sentiment out there. Uh, we, we, we completely understand. I mean, this is not something which is going to be done uh, easily and necessarily uh, speedily, uh, but uh, it's something which has to be done finally. Otherwise, we will end up, frankly, with an increasingly irrelevant United Nations. Thank you. Let me call on Peter Harcher from the City Morning Herald and The Age. Uh, thank you, Dr. Jaishankar. You use the uh, metric of ministerial visits earlier as an indicator of the intensity of the relationship, which is a good input into relationships. What metric would you want to see uh, in terms of outputs over, say, the next five years? What would you like to see the Australia-India relationship achieve uh, specifically over, say, the next five years? Uh, I think one part of me would like to see better numbers better trade numbers, better investment numbers, better tourist numbers, better student numbers. Uh, one part of me would definitely like to see better chemistry, uh, comfort, uh, that on the, on the you know, difficult problems of the world uh, and difficult problems that we individually face, uh, we have a, a better ability to work together. Uh, uh, and for me, you know, uh, chemistry is, is something which is, and not just leader level chemistry, sometimes institutional chemistry. Uh, you know, uh, quite honestly, if I were to look back over the last six, seven years and uh, think of my Australian counterparts and, you know, uh, uh, reflect on how much more openly we talk today to each other. Uh, that's to me a big change because uh, uh, th that at the end of the day is a very, very important indicator of how good or not good your relationship is. Uh, perhaps in some senses, the, the ambition, the, the scale of the impact that we make. Uh, so uh, what it really means is you give me better trade, better investment, a stronger quad, uh, you know, uh, deeper defense. All these are, are examples of what, will, you know, how I would measure progress. Thank you. I see Senator Simon Birmingham, the Shadow Foreign Minister. Thank you very much. Thank you, Michael. And thank you to Loie for hosting this event. Uh, Dr. Chaishenka, thank you very much for the commitment you have shown to the Australia-India relationship, uh, the manner in which you have helped to build it, uh, and the seamless way in which you have dealt with the changes of leadership, ministers and governments in our country through that time. You spoke of the three C's in challenges that you identified, and it's nice to think about, even though they're all challenging ones, but nice to think about a different set of three C's than the ones that culturally often are highlighted in the Australia-India relationship. Can I take you to the C that perhaps hasn't been dealt with in the remarks tonight? Uh, Michael and others have touched on the conflict one. COVID, we hope we are putting behind us and moving beyond, but climate change remains a very significant one for global dialogue moving forward. What do you see Australia and other nations like Australia needing to do 
and not to do in terms of helping to ensure that together uh, we can tackle a challenge like climate change and to help India be able to fulfil your ambitions and missions in growth, but also to decarbonise uh, through that growth agenda? Uh, you know, it's it's now close to a year since we uh, we had COP26. We are moving to COP27 next month. Uh, if you look back at this year, uh, I think pretty much across the world, the sense of alarm about uh, about climate events and climate emergencies has increased very sharply. Uh, you know, the parts of the world which have had much more rain than they ever had, and I think I'm probably sitting in one right now, uh, but there are parts of the world where you had, I mean, Europe, for example, uh, had a complete short shortfall of rain. I mean, it was, it was a very hot summer. Uh, uh, you're seeing, you know, uh, uh, you're seeing floods, you're seeing uh, heat waves, you're seeing, uh, you know, uh, mountainous events, coastal events. So uh, there are two issues here. One, how serious are we about pursuing our commitments? And at the heart of the issue is uh, uh, really the ability to, the willingness really to deploy the uh, the finance necessary for it. Uh, we, you know, the COPs have been kind of repetitive cycle, you know, Groundhog Day conversations. Every COP is the same. You know, there's an argument. How serious are you? How much money are you willing to put up? Where does it take us? We have it again the next COP. Uh, there are solutions. You know, after all, it's not like the world can't find money. I mean, the world's uh, you know, I was in the UN and somebody pointed out to me that uh, uh, 100 billion was the commitment made in Paris uh, for, for climate change uh, per year. The commitment made for the Ukraine conflict is close to 100 billion dollars. Uh, so, so it's a question of whether we really see it as existential, are we really willing to act on it? Uh, and to say that, you know, the money will come from the private sector. Look, the private sector is not going to lead. Governments have to lead. You know, multilateral institutions have to lead. I, 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 I don't, you know, uh, this is not a, a failure of imagination. It's actually uh, an unwillingness to really, uh, to put the necessary resources out there. I mean, at the end of the day, I'm not completely convinced the people who say this is existential believe that. Uh, so so we, we really think that it's important uh, to step up. On India's part, I mean, what we have done is we've said, look, we are prepared to do what it takes in India uh, for, uh, you know, uh, because, uh, you know, climate change is not something which is uh, we can keep away through negotiation. I mean, it's going to happen anyway. So you look at the changes in India in terms of our renewable programs, energy efficiency programs, uh, the smart city programs, the lifestyle adjustment campaigns, which uh, we've been leading. We will do our part in terms of climate action, but we do believe that there is a climate justice part to it. There are countries who may not have the capabilities and resources that we have, uh, and that they do deserve a, you know, more than a helping hand. Uh, so uh, I, I would say it's important for the global debates today not to be consumed by any single issue, however important those issues are. You know, we can't run the world as a one agenda uh, world. I'm going to take the last question, Minister, um, and change tack one more time. You mentioned at the UN recently, you met, I think, with 100 foreign ministers from around Dibotic. the world. Yeah. Um, let me ask you, when you look at those foreign ministers, or if you want to be diplomatic, look at foreign other other foreign ministers you've observed in the past or leaders is there one individual that you've encountered that you really admired in as a as a professional as as an as a as a minister or a diplomat in his or her ability to prosecute their country's interests and push their values is there someone that really uh you learned a lot from uh, you know, uh, that one I have to dodge because if I said <laughs> that, I will lose a lot of friends. 
Uh, so, but you, you know, I, what about I've, someone from history then? Uh, I've I've actually had uh, made some discoveries. I'm, I must tell you, uh, in in my country, typically, and I guess in yours too, uh, our system of politics, uh, you have politicians who become ministers. Uh, and so mostly foreign ministers are people who spend their entire life in politics. So I'm, I'm an exception uh, in a way in mind. There's been one other diplomat who's been a foreign minister. Uh, when I became foreign minister, I actually discovered a very large number of foreign ministers, actually diplomats, where, where diplomats who got kind of promoted progressively. And this mm-hmm. is the tradition uh, in, in their uh, countries. And, uh, you know, when, when you work with people, uh, you, d- frankly, each one of them, there's something you you kind of take away. I know that sounds terribly diplomatic, but actually, it, you know, I, I give you it's it's a bit like cricket. Okay, you bowl at anybody. There's no there's nobody you play against from whom you don't have you you are studying them all the time, saying okay, this is the weakness, this is the strength. Don't you know? Don't bowl outside the off stump to this guy. Uh, so it's it's a bit like that. You you keep assessing. You keep probing, you keep, mm. uh, you keep learning, you know. Uh, there are people, uh, you know, with whom I'd take chances, there are people with whom I wouldn't. So there's not a Steve War of diplomacy that you want to nominate tonight? <laughs> not publicly, no. Okay, all right. Well, ladies and gentlemen, this is a limited overs match tonight, so we're going to draw a line under it. Um, I think he had a pretty good innings at the Lowy Institute tonight. I did my best to bowl up a few uh, googlies and even the odd doosra, but he just with pretty effortlessly, I think, um, hit them to the boundary. Um, I did hear him commit at the beginning to a co-authored book between Jay Shankar and me on uh, cricket and diplomacy, so I think I have witnesses um, for, for that point. I think you made some important um, points tonight, and, and for me the one that, that I took away was your conclusion that the warming and the thickening of relations between Australia and India is now structural, that it goes, that it builds on the work of, of individual ministers and diplomats, but it goes beyond that. And I think that's something I hope is the case. I recall the 2021 ORF survey, which found that two thirds of young Indians trust Australia and the Lowy Institute um, survey in the same year that found a very similar number of Australians trust India. Uh, and that's a very good basis um, from which to work. We, you, you've you've told me before how satisfied you are with the with the, with the bilateral relationship. And by visiting twice in a year and spending two weeks in Australasia, you're really walking the walk. We always have to look for new ways of thickening the relationship. We we hope that Mr. Modi will be visiting Australia next year for the Quad Leaders meeting. And of course, if we wanted a practical way of thickening it, then getting Mr. Modi on the Lowy Institute stage, mm-hmm. I think, would be an important one. So we can take I, that away as a, I, as a I, joint I know that. Um, as a joint exercise. Ladies and gentlemen, it's been, a, I think, a real treat to have so much time with the minister tonight. So please join me in thanking His Excellency Dr. Subramanian Jai Shankar. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.